you know, if I'm to give advice to someone who's going through something like this, I would say just remember that your path in life, it can only be taken by you. There's no one else who can take your path in life. Um, and I probably would have done some things differently if I'd known then what I know now. The abuse of alcohol and drugs is a symptom of a bigger problem, which I discovered later on in life. And through my darkest moments in life, I wish in the past I had known that my higher power was there, like I know now. But what I've really gained out of recovery is is a sense of spirituality that I never had before in my life. I do feel guided, and I do feel that there is someone holding my hand or with a hand on my shoulder now. What is it that I'm actually looking for? Do we really know life? Sure. But let me say intelligence. Emotional intelligence, social intelligence, financial intelligence. So I believe it's important for each and every one of us to understand the rules that govern in the arena of your life. You are tuned in to Revenge of the Forsaken Gods, a podcast that seeks to uncover lost wisdom, things that we weren't taught by our parents, society, or schooling, for whatever reason. Maybe they forgot, maybe they didn't want to share, or maybe they just didn't know. And I do this by exploring books, movies, and conversations with different people in an attempt to educate, inspire, and inform. I am your host, Andrew Balongo Opere. Now, I'm very excited for my guest that I'm having today. Oh, my goodness. He is a radio presenter. He is a TV producer at Nusu Nusu Productions, and he considers himself an all-around media guy. Now, an interesting thing about him is that you might not know is he used to be a bartender while he was at school during college, and that's how he actually paid his way through college. And he competed in mixologist competitions. If you don't know what that is, you're about to find out. And it is through that experience that gave him his skills for radio. And when I met my guest, I actually met him at a mental health forum. And I was so amazed at his swag. You know, he was articulate. He had presence. He commanded the room. And normally when you we had, and normally when we encounter people like that, they kind of have egos, but he was actually very kind, very compassionate. And even after the session, he would give you time and he would speak to you. And just as he gave people his time at that avenue, I would like to give him time to talk now during this time. With no longer ado, let me introduce my guest, Fareed Kimani. How are you doing, man? Wow, that's quite an introduction. <laughs> hey, it's it's the truth, man. Hey, Nikwega, <laughs> thank, thank you for it. Kimani, Nikwega. <laughs> thank you very much, man. Thank you, Andrew. That's nice. That's a really nice introduction. I'm glad that that uh, where, where we met in that forum, the impact was that um, that powerful. I really that that makes me very happy. Yes, and before we get into that. Uh, you know, I'm thinking that you're you're Kikuyu, man. But when I look at you, you don't look Kikuyu at all. So are you pointy? <laughs> yeah. Or, or does no, 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 no. So yeah, the H is actually it's actually a Gujarati name. So with oh. the H. So, um, but but interestingly enough, my family uh, is actually from Nanuki. So whenever I tell people I'm from Nanuki, they're like, "Oh, right, Kimani, right? Yeah." Like they just assume the two go hand in hand. So, all right. So yeah. uh, for your Gujarati origin, wow, that's that's good. To yes, say. yes, um, yes, on my on my dad's side, yes. Okay, and on your mom's side. Uh, so actually, if you go back to our ancestry, on my mom's side, we're actually Iranian, mm-hmm. so Persian, yes. and on my dad's side, you would actually go all the way back to Burma. We're actually from uh, from Myanmar. Wow! If, if you go back to our ancestry, yeah. Wow, that's a unique combination. In fact, how did those two come together? Did they come together in Kenya <laughs> no. or from abroad? They met and then they came. I have no idea, man. No idea. I know. I know. My parents met in Nairobi, um, uh, and that was in 1971, maybe like 1971, wow. perhaps. Yeah. So wow. you know, for people my age, it doesn't seem that long ago. But for the younger generation, that's like you know, ancient times. You know. Yeah, it's like ancient times. So if you don't mind my asking, since you you mentioned the age thing, uh, how old are you? Mm, I'm 45. Wow, okay. So yes, I'd love unpacking all the wisdom, all the goodness you've seen in your 45 years of uh, walking here on earth. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, ever since you were a kid, did you always want to be in broadcast? Or what did you want to be when you were a kid? Actually, yeah, it's really interesting. I, 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 it's, it's, I just had a friend of mine who reconnected with me on Facebook who actually said to me, and it really, it really stuck with me. She said, it's so nice to see you living your dream. And, and this is a friend of mine from, from, uh, who I met in, in, in Atlanta when I was living there for two years. And it just, I started thinking back that, man, this, this has always been my dream. So it's quite crazy. I often take it for granted because I've managed to do in front of the camera, uh, as an actor, as a presenter, behind the camera, as a director, as a producer, a script writer for production, a radio presenter, a radio producer, you know, I've, I've kind of ticked, and I started off as a print journalist, so I've kind of ticked all the boxes in media. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess so. I mean, I think from the age of 12, 13, 14, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to my first dream job was to be a wartime correspondent for a, like an international broadcaster. I still haven't done that yet, so. But perhaps there's time. You know what I mean? So. Hey, technically speaking, you are a correspondent in the time of war. People are calling this World War Three. There you go. <laughs> uh, and I'm on air every morning, six days a week. So technically, I do have that that luxury. But I mean, it was always to sort of be one of the guys in the flak jackets and the you know blue helmets in the middle of a war uh, it's just i don't know why it must have been something i watched on tv as a kid that just kind of stuck with me you know yes yes and um where did you go to high school so i i i went to high school in a high school in saint augustine in florida called saint joseph's academy wow, wow. Uh, and i went to junior high school uh at a school called cathedral parish school which is another catholic school even though i'm a muslim um so most of my schooling was done in northeast florida from the age of maybe eight years old uh up through university so wow and how was that difference you know you coming from starting out growing up in kenya and then now continuing in the u.s what was the cultural differences what was the culture shock what was uh, the experiences that you had you know, I mean, you can imagine what Nanyuki looked like in the 70s and 80s. And then you go to Florida, which is, you know, Florida, which you see in the, in the, in the, in the you know, in the pictures online. Oh, yeah. Uh, for those of you who have been, you, you'll understand. Um, it's, it's night and day. It's night and day. But, you know, there were so many great memories I had from my grandparents and then Yuki. So I never really kind of, you know, forgot the roots I had, but I would say that there was a, a part of me that still feels even now very American. All right. Based on the, the, the you know, they say you're most, vulner, uh, most uh, impressionable during your formative years. And my formative years were obviously spent in North Florida. So, so I would say, yeah, I mean, you can probably tell by my accent as well, that that's, you know, stuck with me for, for a long, long period of time. I know. In fact, sometimes, you know how someone can have like a different accent. And uh, in fact, there's this joke, you know, it's like Mm. any Kenyan, when they go to anywhere in the world, it's like when they come back, they get an American accent. You know, you go to Italy for two weeks, they come back with an American <laughs> accent. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you never I know see, some people like that. Yeah, but you never see anyone when they go to India, you know, they come back saying, Hey, hello, Farid, how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, to my yeah, show? True, huh? no one no one wants that accent unfortunately <laughs> you know <laughs> but it's just interesting about the power of linguistics and sound what an accent does mm. and uh very yes in fact i'd like to find out how has been your experience growing up as a muslim and you had to go to catholic mm. school was that a conflict was it hard I, you know, I, uh, I've been, you know, fortunate, I'll say now, to have experienced racism at the deepest core, if you talk about a place like North Florida, um, and being the only non-white kid in the school uh, for eight years, you know, two different junior high and high school, and have been asked things such as, where's your tail monkey? and you know, called all kinds of names. Um, what I did is I used it to fuel uh, fuel my success. So I became an athlete. 
um, started playing basketball uh, and excelled in basketball. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, the more I became a star athlete, the less people cared about the color of my skin. Uh, and I became defined by something else, which was my, my ability to, to play sports. Uh, also academically as well. I took school very seriously. Um, I was an honor student. Um, and, and, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm quite blessed in the sense that I never really, I have, I have quite a photographic memory, so I remember things quite well. So I would get good grades without really having to put in the effort. That was, that was nice. When I got to college, I realized that that doesn't work. <laughs> that, that system, that yes. system doesn't work in college because it's much harder. Uh, and I had to relearn how to learn when I got to college. But, but growing up in, in, in North Florida, you know, as a, my parents were owned a motel. There were a lot of jokes about Indians owning motels. Um, it was, uh, it was tough. It was tough. There were times I didn't want to go back to school. Um, but my dad was a typical Indian dad that was like, no, 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 you go back. Uh, you know, you beaten up today. Eventually they'll get tired of it. <laughs> you know? so, so eventually you, um, you learn to deal with it. It was academics or athletics to, to change people's perceptions of me, you know, uh, and not be defined by color of my skin or where I'm from or, or, you know, what kind of accent I have for that matter, you know? So, so that's kind of what, how I, I, even, even to this day, when I started on radio, the, the conversation was, oh, he's not Kenyan, his accent is too white. And then, you know, 20 years later, you know, it's, it's, you know, just stay true to who you are, I guess. I think that's probably the best advice I can give anyone. Just stay true to who you are. I don't want to be someone else, you know, I like being me. So, and, and I can't be another version of me. I have to be this version of me, you know. Yourself. It's, it's me, it's the company, so. Absolutely. And how do you stay true to yourself when your environment around you has a different idea of how you should be? You know, it's not easy. No, uh, I, I, I completely agree with you, Andrew. I think it is very difficult to, to, especially at a certain, you know, at a young age when, you know, kind of all you, all you really want to do is, is fit in. Right. I mean, that's, um, and be part of, be part of a community or be part of a, let's say the popular kids or the cool kids. <laughs> um, I just learned, uh, you know, at that point that I was going to use other, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to sit here and say that I had it all figured out. I had my moments where I felt like it wasn't, it wasn't worth it or it wasn't something I wanted to continue doing, you know, but, um, you know, you just have to kind of look, I like being told I can't do something. I like being told, um, you know, that, that this is not for you. You should try something else. I like all of these things. It, 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 that's kind of what drives me. Um, so I, I, you know, if I'm to give advice to someone who's going through something like this, I would say just remember that your your path in life, it can only be taken by you. There's no one else who can take your path in life. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to decipher that at a young age because it, it may not make sense. I'm talking from where I sit now. Um, and I probably would have done some things differently if I'd known then what I know now. Um, you know, I mean... I was never the guy who got the girl in, 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 in high school. Um, really? And though you're but so I, suave and, you know, it's like, it's like you had all, <laughs> that all came later. <laughs> that came later. That came later. <laughs> and then I, and then I really, yeah, went a bit crazy with that side of things as well. <laughs> but I, 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 um, I, 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 I focused on two things and that was my, 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 my academics and, and becoming an athlete, uh, and two things I love, you know, I've been watching this, um, the final dance documentary of Michael Jordan on Netflix. Um, man, I'll tell you, if you want to learn what perseverance and being the underdog is, watch that documentary. You'll be surprised to know that Michael Jordan was let go on his uh, high school team. He told he wasn't good enough. And I mean, I think we all know how he turned out. You know what I mean? So, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
technically so, he's, the, so, he's the embodiment of started from the bottom now we're here it, and 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 you know everyone in their own level of variation has that opportunity i mean you know you could you can say when i started on radio 20 years ago i mean i i, I was told it would never work you know and and i'm still here one of the very few people still able to do relevant radio uh built a production company based on the fact that and radio was my starting point but so it's it's relative to each person's journey you know when you start something start start with your heart and have a goal and and i think you know and passion passion is a big thing I and mean, once you have those things it becomes quite you know no there's no easy ride but satisfaction is very sweet you know what i mean yes you're actually reminding me of um a talk i forget her name i think it's elizabeth gilbert she mentions mm-hmm. how important it is to follow your passion and she says that for lack of a better word life will give you a shit sandwich to eat and if you're doing something that you love the days that you're having your downtime when things are bad you when you're eating your shit sandwich your passion will take you through as opposed to when you're doing a job or you're doing something you're not passionate about when those down days come you'll be like oh i hate this i just want to quit you know so yeah exactly it is important that uh, to follow your passion and people take that for granted exactly yeah agreed yes and uh, in fact I've, i've noticed that you have a particular you know style you have a particular knowledge of the way you interact with people and uh, i know a lot of people tend to look down on school but what did you learn about communication in school because you did do a bachelor's in communication and journalism from uh, um what is it UNF University of uh, Florida North Florida North yeah North Florida yes tell me about your experience North Florida yeah um that was when i became you know the person i am closest to the person i am now university was my was my what do you say when they say you might when i spread my wings if you will um you know i just discovered a lot about myself about my dreams about what i wanted to do about what i what i liked and didn't like in life uh about putting up boundaries i made so many good friends friends i'm still in touch with to this day um i think back to those days i can remember i can remember university like it was yesterday to be honest um it was an incredible experience i i would never tell someone to study or not to study but what i would say is that what i got out of university was much more than than academics you know i um this is where i developed as a human being um where i i just i just really just the, the joy of of working every day studying in the mornings taking breaks at the bar studying i really loved that i loved the hardship i went through i, I you know i i look at people who had university paid for and i'm just like yeah okay but you didn't experience university you know i was part of that clique of people that you know couldn't go out you know to parties because we were working or I mean I did go out to parties but I'm saying all the time or or couldn't you know sleep in uh, and take afternoon classes because I had to be at the bar or the restaurant in the afternoon working I was it, there was a just a genuine satisfaction to to what I did and and when you say what did I learn about communication or well, communication for me as much as I st- studied communications communication for me came in all the other things I was doing around my studying you know um uh, interaction with people working in 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 the service industry for example um you know it, it got me out of a shell of 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 you know insecurity and and not knowing who i was into this being you know confident behind this bar this you know 3 feet of wood that separated me from the customer you know so um you know where you know all of a sudden i'm calling the shots you know i can tell you you've had too much to drink or i can suggest something for you to drink or it, it, i don't want to say it was a sense of power but it gave me a sense of of, of belonging um and maybe to a degree a sense of control as well which you know I didn't have a lot of growing up you know obviously so um but it definitely prepared me for a career in communication for sure do you in fact remember, if I could do anything again and go back to any job I would go back to that job do you remember the day that you got hired to talk about that interview process like how did you choose that specific bar was it a bar on campus near campus 
my goodness. So no, it was a restaurant called Bennigan's, which was about 10 minutes or seven minutes by bus from the university. Uh, and I went in, I think I had a, I made a, I had a friend working there, if I'm not mistaken. He was, he was a bartender. His name was Greg Corcoran. Now I remember very well. Yeah. And he said, come in and apply for a job as a bus boy. Now a bus boy is a person who cleans table, right? So when people are done eating, you go with this big plastic bucket and you just put all the shit in a, in a bucket and you take it to the dishwasher. Um, and the dishwasher there is a human being. It's not like a dishwashing machine. You know what I mean? And, and then, you know, I slowly worked my way up to being a waiter and eventually, you know, getting behind the bar, which is like sort of like the crown jewel of a restaurant, you know, where you just, you know, slinging beers and making cocktails and talking shit with the customers. And yeah, it was really quick. You know, it's, it's interesting. Most, most jobs I've held, I've gotten to the top spot quite quickly, uh, be it in a bar at a radio station and I don't know what the cause of that is, but I'm a pretty quick learner, but I'm also the a master of the art of bullshit as well. I won't lie. <laughs> so I think that helps quite a bit, quite a de- quite a great deal, you know? For those who are not familiar with the art of bullshitting, please break it down. Because it's one thing you to know, work I mean, hard. I'm... It's one thing to work hard in your environment. But to rise up, that means you're applying certain skills that you might not be aware of. Okay. Well, the art of bullshit is, is you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm a pretty epic storyteller in my own right. Um, I enjoy being in, at parties and, and being the one to tell the great stories. And, you know, every great story has a little bit of a, we call it conscious exaggeration, which is bullshit, basically. <laughs> You know, when you say that, for example, you know, I was, you know, I'd had that night I'd drunk, you know, half a bottle of whiskey. Well, you know, in my story, it becomes two bottles of whiskey. You know what I mean? It's just, you're not lying. You're just embellishing a bit for the story. And my mom calls it adding masala, you know. Um, but that also was, you know, a bartender's trick. Um, and it becomes also a radio presenter's trick. What we do on air is basically theater of the mind. It's not, um, you know, a lot of what we do on air, and I shouldn't say this, is is it's maybe not exactly our stories, but stories we're we're borrowing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our, to be honest with you, my life is not that interesting because if you're getting up at four fifteen six days a week, I mean, what really do you have time for? You know, I go to my radio job, uh, I, I finish at ten, I come to my business, I run that until four or five, and then I go home, I have dinner, I watch a bit of TV, and then I prep my show for the next day and. Um, and I remember training a radio presenter once years ago and she said to me, well, I don't want to lie to my audience. So I said, so what do you want to tell them? You want to tell them that you got up, you made your son's lunch for school. You came to work after work, you went and had two meetings and you went home, you made dinner for your family. You watched Netflix with your husband and you went to bed because no one gives a shit and everyone does that. So you need to have some sort of cool life that goes along with, you know, and, and, you know, to be fair, our audience, I feel bad for them because they should really realize that for us to be in our optimum every morning, we're not out partying the night before. It's not possible, right? But I'll come into my radio show and talk about things like, you know, drinking and stuff. And the, and, and I have to be honest, these are stories from my past, but maybe just to make them a bit more current, you know? So the art of bullshit is basically telling a great story and adding a little bit of masala to it, you know? But I think that even the audience knows, and that's the role of a story, because people want to be yes. entertained. So we will yes. so as an audience member, I will suspend disbelief because even though you might not be the direct experience, that was not your direct experience, you're borrowing it from someone, I'm still getting that experience from you telling it. We know that Right. Just like when we tell stories of the hare and the tortoise, we know they don't do that. We've added human qualities to them to pass on a message. Sure. I, I, I guess what you're talking about here, Andrew, is, you know, these we, maybe telling fables is a better way to, to, to describe what it is we're doing. We're telling fables, you know what I mean? And, and they're interesting and enriching and, you know, they, if they connect with somebody, then that's great. Yes, that's true. So, uh, I'd love to hear like 
just one story that you found challenging in your bartender days and one like how did you handle like a situation that was just totally out of control like you know things that just went <laughs> from bad to worse to worse to nightmare okay. to so pandemic the, I, I, I shared I shared this story with with uh, with a woman I'm I'm, I'm dating at uh, the, the other day actually because she asked me we were talking about my bartending days and um, so I was working in this bar in Jacksonville and there was a lady beautiful black American girl I can't even remember her name actually um, but she was beautiful and we started seeing each other um, I did not know that she was married uh to a guy in the navy and jacksonville has quite a big naval base there called mayport so one day i'm i'm cleaning up the bar area and the cocktail table's just on the other side of the bar and there's a there's a, there's a white dude sitting there and he starts saying i'm gonna fucking kill you i'm gonna kill you so like, who's this guy man you know like i had no idea like so i called a couple of my buddies from from university and i'm like i think you guys can you get down here now because there's a guy who won't leave the bar and i think he's waiting for me to walk outside so he can kill me so two of my buddies were two uh former american football players uh they came to the bar and they were waiting there and anyway there's huge thing ensued and they started talking shit to each other turns out that was her husband and they just had a kid and i had no idea um that she was married uh anyway it actually is a tragic story because he never came back after that. Um, but she went back to Georgia where she lived with her family and she actually killed herself. No. Uh, it was actually quite, <laughs> it was, I mean, I, I, I laugh about the beginning, but this part really messed up. So I didn't, I didn't actually date for about 18 months after that. I was really quite messed up. It was a very, it was a very difficult difficult experience for me actually because i think when i found out about her husband she did try to call me a few times and i completely ignored um her call um and yeah that was the the outcome was 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 that which was which is probably the hardest thing i've gone through uh career-wise or job-wise in my life um I, i really wish i could remember her name and i can't remember her name um many years ago we're talking about maybe the year 90, 94, 95. So it's quite some time ago now. Yeah. 25 years ago. My goodness. Yeah. I was, a, wow. I was 20, roughly about 20 years old. Yeah. Gosh. So that's, uh, that was a tough, tough time. And what helped you come out of that? You know, what was going through your mind during those 18 months? You know, I think I was young enough to, to get over it, but I, I didn't seek any help or anything. I just kind of, again, you know, I do what I normally do. I just focused on what I needed to do, you know, which was work, study, work and study and graduate, work, study, graduate. And then, you know, it, um, if it was now, I'd probably seek help. I think I'm much more open about, you know, things like that affect my mental health now than I was say, say back then. So, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know sometimes sharing some stories uh, like that must uh, not be easy. Oh yeah, no. They, I mean, it's 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 been a long enough time as well, you know. So, All right. yes. Would you mind sharing a, a story with me where you applied everything that you know about communication and magic just happened left, right, and center? You're just amazed, like, oh my god, I didn't have this impact in communication at work. Um, you know, there's been a number of radio shows where You're from your bartending all the fun. Oh, oh, um, wow. I can't really think of one specific instance. I just had a knack for, like I said, I could just talk to anyone after a few months of bartending. I just, it was, it was joy to be there. And mm -hmm. I mean, I may, I'll give you one example. I think it was a new year's where I made like two and a half thousand dollars worth of tips. And you can think in those days, which wow. was just, yeah, I, I just, I just had an, you know, I've always been the person that likes to, to be the voice or the face. So again, with bartending, it kind of combined the two things I love the most, you know, 
Uh, that does sound like a bit of an ego trip, and maybe to a degree it, it probably is. You know, part of it is a bit of an ego trip. Uh, but I thoroughly enjoy, even now in my career, being the voice in the face of, of that. So, yeah, I, I can't think of one specific one, but I think it was just, there were many nights when I bartended and I just had a flow. I could I could almost predict what people were going to order, you know. Um, it just kind of happens, you know. You get into, like, the zone and, yeah, it's, it's a okay. incredible feeling. Okay, let's say I come to you. I'm day one know nothing about bartending, know nothing about communication, and you're my trainer. And you're giving me the crash course right now. We're going to have a busy night tonight. Um, COVID-19 has just been eliminated from planet Earth, and they're going to be mega <laughs> parties, and this is your spot, and you want to make sure that I'm competent enough to handle the crowd. What would be three things you'd say, okay, this is your training, boom. Right. Number one, uh take one drink order at a time uh this is a key in bartending you get so overwhelmed sometimes you have 10 people waiting for drinks just focus on one person at a time number two serve the pretty ladies first because they'll always come back uh and number three <laughs> would be don't drink on the job i made that mistake many times and it doesn't help don't drink on the job so, so what's the sense behind uh, serve the pretty ladies first? They'll always come back. Well, when you're out, when when a woman is out with a man, he will buy her as many drinks as she wants. If you connect with that woman, you're you're sorted. So she keeps coming back. You overlook everyone else. Yes, what can I get you? She knows. So she'll be drinking, man. And then she'll come and order his drinks. Then you have three other guys who she's ordering drinks for. And you just you just get a flow going, you know? Okay, okay. And uh, anything, out of the, uh, anything outside of that before uh, we start? Because uh, we're going to start serving guests in a few minutes. Anything else you've left out? Don't spill anything. Because I, if I'm your bar manager, I got to fill out a fucking report at the end of the night about how much shit you spill. <laughs> so don't spill anything. <laughs> All right. So no, no, there's a there's a percentage they call spillage, which you're allowed, mm. which they expect every day. What's but over mean? and above that, it starts coming out of your salary. You know what I mean? Or your tips. Wow. So it's like what five percent? Yeah. It's I think it's five or seven. I I can't really remember now. So it's a person, you know, when you're, when you're pulling a beer on a tap and, and all of a sudden you're doing something else, you turn around, it's kind of pouring over the glass. That, that's the kind of spillage or, you know, um, dropping a bottle on the floor, you know what I mean? Where some of it falls out uh, or pours out. Uh, but it's a very low percentage. Once you go over that at the end of the night, at the end of the month, they'll look at, uh, so it's a collective, right? So it didn't even matter <coughs> if it's a day you worked or not, because they can only tell at the end of the month how much liquor was lost. And then they ask you to to refund them a certain amount of money. Okay. So I noticed um, that in your program at school, you also participated in the, uh, it says what, Brighton film? Yeah. So I went, I went back in 2006 to do a postgraduate in film. I was, I was working here for Mnet and for um, the Nation FM, I think. It was Easy FM in those days. At Nation, yes. and I just picked up and left for a year and did a postgraduate in film direction and production. Biggest waste of fucking money I've ever made in my life. I was absolutely no point for going there. Wow. Um, but it was a nice. I, yeah, you you can't learn media at that level from a textbook. At some point, you need to get immersed in 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 it to to learn. So I wouldn't suggest that. If you're in media, I would say stay and and work. I would have rather have worked that year. Um, not that I lost anything because I didn't, but in terms of my career, but I, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, it oh. wasn't as beneficial as as I thought it would be. So, in other words, the theory did not translate to what's happening on the ground. No, I think you know what I've learned working in media. I've learned from doing not reading, not studying. Um, I think the BA from, from University of North Florida was great because the fundamentals you need, which is just basic media knowledge. Um, but after that, I, don't, I think if you can get in at a young age into a media house or into a job, 
um, that's media related, if that's your chosen career path, I would say then you work your way from there. Okay. I don't think breaks for higher learning because you don't learn much more if you're a smart, intelligent, and you know educated up to a degree person. Then the rest should take care of itself. All right. So, um, okay, fine. So you graduated. You said it was a waste of time. And uh, yeah, talk about your experience after you graduated from your BA. You said you okay. came back to Kenya. One, one second, Andrew. Sure. Andrew, one second. Uh, Jackie, just give me give me about five seven minutes. Yeah. So. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how? Sorry, it, go on. How is it like coming back to Kenya after you graduated? Because obviously you're so from my postgraduate. Uh, well, when I came back, we opened up the production house. Listen, this is my business partner and I. His name is Mark. Mark and I had been working together from 2004 for a production on Mnet called Studio 53. I was a presenter and a producer. Mm-hmm. He was the cameraman and the director. So when I came back, we immediately opened up the production house. And yeah, I mean, if you look at the the productions we've done. Uh, we've done Mashariki mix for Mnet. We do Lit360. In fact, here's the, the mic flag for Lit360. Wow. I'm in my office now. Um, we've done Coke Studio, two seasons of Coke Studio. We've just finished Chapa Dimba for Safaricom. We were doing the Magical Kenya Open, which was canceled, obviously, because of coronavirus. Um, Radio 54, my online show, is produced here. Um, we've done a number of TV commercials, a number of documentaries. and I mean, you know... We've had good years. We've had shit years. Uh, we were coming out of a shit year in 2019, heading into a very good year, which is now turning into be a shit year. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm completely blessed. You know, last year, if you look behind me, I can see there's the Battle of the Beats. Uh, sure. We actually created this real yeah we created this reality show for Smirnoff La- in 2018. This property, uh, which we produced for them from start to finish, and it was hugely successful. Um, this was one of the rooms. Actually, this is where the DJs used to come and chill out and, and make their music. Uh, so this is actually where I'm sitting now as part of this Battle of the Beats Academy. Um, so look, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you can say people complain when they have bad years business-wise. I, I stopped complaining when I got sober, to be honest, because I'm so, I'm so blessed, you know, to, to have say, you know, I, I may not be as rich as I was three years ago and I may be richer again next year than I've ever been in the past. It's, it's the way business works. Uh, or so, maybe not rich is the wrong word, successful. Um, but I'm so blessed to have seen what I've seen. You know, I've traveled most of Africa um, on production. Um, you know, I've, I've interacted with some of the biggest brands in the world in terms of, of work that I do. Uh, I've stayed on top of my game in radio for, you know, 20 years on and off. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't look at life as good and bad anymore. There's no black and white, you know, it's variations of many things. It's not just, oh, it's a good, good day or a bad day. There are bad days that have good elements and there are shit days that have, um, and, and good days that have shit elements. You know what I mean? So, um, and, and that's my takeaway from, you know, from this, I, I know I've got to wrap up cause I'm going on production now. Sure. Um, but you know, there's a couple of things I'd like to share uh, before I go. The way you and I met was based on a conversation about mental health, something I suffer from. Um, and I've had my issues with depression and bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. Um, and, and I go to therapy for that. I found out that those were the cause of another symptomatic problem I had, which is drug and alcohol abuse for many years. Um, the abuse of alcohol and drugs is a symptom of a bigger problem, which I discovered later on in life. Um, what I've learned through sobriety and what I've learned through recovery is there's a community of people out there that are going through the same struggle I'm going through. Uh, and that's why I attend Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous meetings on a regular basis. Now I'm doing them on Zoom. But what I've really gained out of recovery is, is a sense of spirituality that I never had before in my life. Uh, that there is a guiding force. And I, I would not refer to it ever as God because that's not for me to tell you who it is. That might be your reason or my reason, but it doesn't have to be everyone's reason. But I refer to it as my higher power. Um, And through my darkest moments in life, I wish in the past I had known that the higher power, my higher power was was there. Um, Like I know now, um, I do feel guided and I do feel that there is someone holding my hand or with a hand on my shoulder now. 
and I don't think that everyone has to be a recovering addict or everyone has to stop drinking or doing drugs. That's not my issue. Not everyone's an addict. I am. I myself am an addict. But um, the sense of spirituality is a very different, has caused a very different need for me, what I want in life, or what I chase in life. And success is not defined by money or followers on Instagram, <laughs> um, where maybe in the past that it, it, it was. What is success defined to you as now? Uh, being of service to people, um, creating comfortable <laughs> situations for family and friends, being present and being accountable to people that, that need you and that count on you, uh, being honest, um, being empathetic, being uh, not cheating, not lying, not stealing, all things that I did in my active addiction um, and before I found my spirituality. Um, being satisfied with my work, um, even if sometimes it doesn't translate into big money. I'm glad that you share that. And I uh, really thank you for opening up to that because not a lot of men do share that. And I know every human being comes to that point of crisis in their life and they wish, you know, they had someone who's been there who could share. But I find that even, mm. you know, our fathers, our leaders, um, for whatever reason, they don't share. And I think that's why mm. the power of storytelling even has saved my life. And hence, you know, trying to get your story and appreciate for the time that you've given us, I consider this part one. And uh, Yeah, sure. I hope we can do it again. I don't know how long yes. this, uh, I don't know if we have, if, if this is only part of the first podcast with me or, yes, I think this, or is, this will run. And this is, this is, this is the first part. Cause now I wanted to ask you more in depth, you know, what, what okay. gave you, like what gave you the impulse to seek help? I know that's a whole nother story. Okay. And even well, as well, well, why don't we do that? Is, is tomorrow possible? Yes, tomorrow is possible. And before we okay. we end this session, I'd like to finish every session with what have been three movies, three books, three songs that have impacted your life? Okay. Three songs would be Losing My Religion by R.E.M. I Believe I Can Fly by R. Kelly. <laughs> wow, um, yeah, and um, uh, the song One by Metallica. Mm. Wow. Um, Where, three to that too? Uh, I think it's just the message in the lyrics you know all of them kind of are about coming to the end of your line and having to seek what's next you know um, and in, in different levels you know I believe I can fly is more of an inspirational positive song losing my religion is basically about coming to the end of your line uh, and 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 you know trying to find faith when you can. And uh, one by Metallica is literally about giving up. Um, and I mean, if you look at the lyrics in these songs, whoever is listening to this, um, you'll see how these three songs kind of point to the right, the same thing, but all with different outcomes. Three books. Um, I'll give you one that I'm reading now because I'm not such an avid reader. And most of the books I'm reading are on recovery, but it's called Recovery by Russell Brand. And it's, uh, he's a, he's a, recovering addict the comedian russell brand um very intelligent guy and he wrote a book called recovery where he breaks it down for idiots like myself and simplifies the the road the path of recovery it's fantastic i would recommend it to people who are recovering not recovering addicted or not addicted to to read it because it really is a beautiful book and if you know someone who's who has an um uh, a substance abuse problem it will really help you to understand them um so it's a recommended reading for me um three movies Look, I'm a mafia fan, so Goodfellas, Scarface, um, and if I had to pick one funny movie, it would be Old School with Will Ferrell. Mm, mm, mm. Wow, I'll definitely have to look out for that. Uh, I've not been like a huge Will Ferrell fan, but oh yeah, Scarface that was like an impactful movie. Never get high on your own supply. Exactly. You break the rules. <laughs> yeah, you know what happened. But I appreciate mm. you sharing uh, part one of your story, Farid. It's very okay. really been inspirational, especially as a man sure. during this time, realizing that success for a man is not the material things that we've been shown. That sure. uh, there's a whole emotional and mental side that we need to cultivate. So 
the absolutely whole, the whole reason even i did this podcast is to i consider it as my world school the stuff that i didn't learn in regular school and uh, you're one of my great lecturers, uh, for for everyone just sharing the experiences Super. so thank you great man much. thank you very much so we'll chat again tomorrow and we'll finish the the conversation sure all right that sounds good thank you for your time Thank you very much for joining us this week on the Revenge of the Forsaken Gods. I have been your host, Andrew Balongo Opere, and my guest has been Farid Kimani. Make sure to visit our website at revengeoftheforsakengods.home.blog where you can access all of the show notes from this conversation. And also, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or on your preferred podcast platform so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you have found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would really help us out too. If you like being appreciated during your birthday, please tweet Fareed Kimani, that's F-A-R-E-E-D, K-H-I-M-A-N-I. Just to wish him a happy birthday. It was his birthday yesterday. And uh, we just like to appreciate this stellar, awesome guy. He's been impacting us with his voice on radio and in other capacities with his productions and just in sharing his stories. So if you've known him and you forgot it was his birthday, just go out and tweet him real quick or give him a call. Or if this is your first time getting to know Fareed through this conversation, please do send him a quick tweet just to show your appreciation. Let him know how uh, this conversation has helped you out, what you've learned from it. He's given out a lot of impactful advice, a lot of tips. I'm just amazed. So you can listen to the whole show on YouTube or on your preferred podcast platform. Or if you don't have the time to listen to the whole conversation, I have provided many clips of the conversation on YouTube so you can check that out. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode and thank you for listening and hopefully you have been inspired you have gained some insights and you have been educated today go out and have an awesome life